joined one of our online seminars before. Uh, we do these every few months or so. Um, pick some new topic, dig in, go through. Uh, recently there is the 11.2 release. And so I kind of went through, looked at a lot of the new features, picked out things that I liked, uh, things that I thought were useful and cool and fun, and we're going to go through those today. Um, this is actually a good seminar for a new user as well, because we're going to just kind of walk through a model from geometry all the way through to results um, step by step, and we'll be talking about new features along the way. Um, Usually George Laird is on the line. I'm flying solo, so if you guys have any questions, I'll probably have to get to them at the end or maybe follow up with email. If there's any sort of problems with audio or with the, the video feed having, having problems, um, there is a chat box or a questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel, uh, so you can pop in there. Um, feel free to chime in and say, hey, I'm having trouble, or, uh, you know, the background noise is terrible, or <laughs> just let me know. And that's also where we can do any sort of questions about the software, um, which I can address later on. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this seminar and all of our previous seminars are available on the Applied CAX website. Uh, so maybe early next week, We'll have this video recording uploaded. We'll have the example models that I used during the presentation. And then we'll have this little uh, this presentation here that kind of outlines the different topics that we're talking about. Here's kind of the table of contents. Um, there is a lot of new features in 11.2, and I don't really have enough time uh, to discuss them all. I really went through and picked out what I thought was really important and fun uh, this is what we've got. They've updated Solid Slice. You can get a lot more creative with that. Uh, some pre-processing as far as moving geometry around, picking geometry. Some new meshing, a great way to edit existing elements like splitting plates, splitting hexes, um, editing rigid elements. There's a nice new tool for that. Once we get into post-processing, we'll talk about analysis studies, a new way to organize your output sets group them together into studies. Um, there's a new way to contour. There is a new free body. You can use a section cut, which is nice, quick, and simple. And then uh, we've got some graphics that we'll talk about at the end. All right, so first of all, we'll do solid slice. Uh, previously, solid slice, you'd pick your solid, you'd pick a plane, and it would slice all the way through uh, your solid on this infinite plane. Now, with this example here, if we wanted to slice off one little tab, we would have to slice it and then add the other tab back in. Now it allows you to use curves, it allows you surfaces, sheet solids, so you can just section off small portions of your solid, and you can use a curved cutting plane, like here I've got this, this sheet solid. I think that's really handy, it's really useful, especially when you want to subdivide geometry, uh, but you don't want to blast all the way through it. So today, we're going to be working with this little example model. I've taken one of the uh, FEMAP examples that comes with under here, FEMAP examples. There's lots of help examples and sample models. I've taken one of those pieces of geometry and modified it a bit. And you can see I've got all these different steps through the process that you guys will be able to download later on. So here it is, this little clevis. Um, you may have seen this in previous workshops or online seminars. I've just done a little bit of virtual machining here so that we can mid-surface it later on. But let's look at this new solid slice. Solid slice. You can see there's a new dialog box that allows you to make your choices. So you can always go with, with plane. Um, that's just like the previous version. Or now there's uh, with sheet solid, with curve, or long face. Let's do it with this sheet solid. Click OK. You pick the solid that you want to slice, and that is our clevis. And then you select the solid that you want to slice with. And I'll pick this sheet solid here. There we go. Now if we look in the model info tree, we can blank our sheet solid. And you can see it uses that face as like a curved cutting face and it leaves your sheet solid behind so you can use it for other operations. You don't have to sacrifice your sheet solid anymore. 
Uh, same thing works with a curve. Let's go with curve. We'll pick the solid. And then we'll select the curve. I've got this little spline drawn up here. And then we'll pick a vector to project that down. So I want the negative y direction like that. And you can see we've imprinted a little sad Batman logo here into our geometry. So this is a great way to do some geometry modification in FEMAP. A lot of this stuff was rather difficult or required multiple steps. Um, I think just making a hole in a, in a feature when, with FEMAP was multiple step process. So before, this is a nice improvement. All right, now with my geometry, I don't need to slice any of it for our workshop. So I'll go back here get rid of this sheet solid and I'm going to get rid of this little curve up here. Now this is going to be the geometry that we'll work through today. Okay, uh, first thing I want to do is do some de-featuring. You can see there's lots of little blends, uh, lots of small features on here that I'm not going to need, especially if I'm going to be mid-surfacing. Uh, previously I would use geometry, solid, remove face, and I could start picking fillets. Um, I always liked to use add connected fillets. It was kind of nice. It would chase those fillets around the model and allow you to get rid of multiple at once. Uh, but there's something even better. A lot of these tools are migrating to the meshing toolbox. So there's a nice local spot to go for geometry preparation, modification, mesh sizing, uh, remeshing. All this stuff is migrating here. And if it sits in the meshing toolbox, it's nice because you can do it on a mesh part. It'll modify the underlying geometry and it'll update the mesh. <clears throat> Pardon. So I'm going to start with feature removal. There is now an option to remove blends. We turn on the selector for the meshing toolbox and then we just pick solid. You notice we're not picking blends, we pick the solid. And on this first round, you can see it's wiped out all of those small blends, all those small fillets. I can do it again, and it takes out the next biggest level of fillets here. So if I do undo, you can kind of see the progression here. Smallest, largest. Now on this last step, I lost uh, these curves on this end tab here. Now, Yes, those are blends, but those are big. I don't want to remove those. You can always set a limit size. So I'm going to do something like an eighth of an inch. We'll do this again. I want to get rid of the blends in these pockets, but not these curves here. And there we go. Let's preserve those because they're larger than my limit size. So that works out well. Um, sometimes you'll have to do this in multiple steps. Uh, it's not always a one click. Sometimes I'll start with a... Uh, a smaller limit size, get rid of the smallest fillets first and work my way up, uh, kind of like kind of like it worked out here. Okay, next I am ready to do some mid-surfacing. So I'll turn this off. I'm going to come to Geometry, Mid-Surface, Automatic. This is the old standby for mid-surfacing your geometry. Um, but I want to explore this a bit more. There's a few things that you can do uh, to help the process along. All right, first of all, we want to select all the surfaces that we want to mid-surface. Then we select a target thickness. And I've got this thickened section here. I want it thicker than my largest section, so I can use the measuring tool and measure off of this. So this is a good time to bring up the new, uh, the new Smart Snap. If you do the right click, previously you had snap to point, snap to node, snap to screen. Uh, what they've introduced in 11.2 is Smart Snap. And this is a great tool because it will snap to nodes and points um, and curve midpoints. So you don't have to switch back and forth. So I'm going to measure from here to here. This 0.175. I'm not going to combine my mid surfaces. I want to do some modification and I'll add them all together later on. But let's go ahead and uh, see how this works out. All right, so it has mid surfaced. If you look in the model infantry, I have all these new mid surfaces here. I can blank the original solid to see what it's given me. And it looked like in this region here, 
Uh, it's not quite what I wanted to do. I don't want to form a ring like this. Um, I just want a simple hole. On this end, it's much more pronounced and I like that. Uh, but I'm going to try this again. I'm going to do Control Z to undo. And I'm going to come back. Now this time, I'm going to start by selecting everything, but I am going to deselect or exclude some of the surfaces here. Because if you if you realize how the mid-surfacer works, you can make some smart decisions in what surfaces you pick, and it will get you where you want to go with uh, less work down the road. So I have deselected those cylindrical surfaces there. So with no cylindrical surfaces in the original selection, it's not going to generate any cylindrical mid-surfaces. It just sees this front face and this back face, and that should give me what I want. Target thickness was 0.175. Let's take a look at this one. There we go. So that means right what I want there. Um, I'm always switching back and forth my original solid and my mid surface to kind of see how my idealized geometry compares to the original. A uh, new feature that I really like that kind of makes this a bit easier is if you right click in the checkbox here, this is the visibility options, you can do hide surfaces. So you can see that keeps the curves and the points of that solid visible, but it makes all of the surfaces transparent. So you can look at your original solid, the outline, and your mid-surface geometry at the same time to see, all right, I want to trim that, I want to save that. Um, it's really great when you have the part meshed, you can turn on your thickness, and it's a good comparison between your original solid and your final plate mesh. So there's a couple of things that I need to take care of here. Uh, it looks like I ended up with a little extra plate here. Um, obviously this intersection is going to need some work. And then I have these little tabs here where in the original solid it's taking the mid plane of this flange and using that as the top surface. It gets to this tab here and it's not sure if it should carry on that, that top surface or use the outer edge. So I'll probably just trim those off. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is trim some surfaces. And we're going back to the meshing toolbox. I'm going to go to Geometry Editing, and I'm going to use Project Curve. So I'm going to use Project Curve, and I need to switch it over to Extend Clean. And I'm going to use this curve along this edge here, and it's going to extend it to the very edge here so I can trim off this little tab. First thing you do, turn it on. You pick the surface that you want to trim and then you select the curve that you want to trim with. Like that, you can see how that chopped it off right there. So I can cruise through the rest of these, and now those are separate surfaces. I can come and delete those later. Now this is very similar to uh, geometry mid-surface extend, but again, it's now sitting in the meshing toolbox. We could do this on a meshed part and it would not only affect the geometry, but it would update the mesh as well. Similarly, we can do it to this surface here. Ended up with a little bit extra that I don't quite need. If I try to delete that surface, you can see it's all one. So I really want to slice it off right here. I'm going to use this project curve, um, but I don't need to extend it anymore. I'm just going to imprint. So I turn it on. I pick my surface, and then I pick the curve that I want to imprint. So I'm going to pick this curve, which is kind of the back edge of this surface here. There we go. So now you can see those surfaces have been broken. Come to this side, we'll do the same. This surface, trim with that curve. All right, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and delete some surfaces. I've got these little pieces here, these pieces here, and I've got these, these kind of artifacts here, which I do not need. All right. Now we're going to do a little bit more imprinting, uh, but we'll do that later on. 
Now, most of this geometry is fairly clean. I think it's going to add together quite nicely, uh, but this intersection here is clearly lacking some connectivity. Now, I'm not sure how I would do this in the past. Um, you know, maybe I would build a plate here and a new plate here to extend that so I'd have this, this junction. Uh, what they've added in is this project and move point. And this is really nice to close up gaps, um, to move slight sort of tolerances where your mid surfaces aren't coming together at a coincident curve. You can kind of just move things around. And the way it works is you pick, first you pick the location that you want to move to. So I'm gonna use this corner here as my final destination. Next, we pick the point that we want to move. So I click this here and it moves that curve over. You can see it just deforms that curved surface until it meets up with that point. So I'll do the same for this one and I can do it down at the bottom here. So you pick your destination first, then you pick the point you wanna move. Now all of those come together nice and cleanly. Again, this is a big idealization here. I would wanna compare my final mesh to my original part Things have definitely changed, uh, but for a simplification for a mid-surface model, this works out just fine. Let's do the same to the other side. There we go. Now at this point, uh, these are still separate solids. I have not added them, added them together. And that's why at the beginning when I mid-surfaced, I chose not to combine mid-surfaces. This command will work with combined mid-surfaces or a sheet solid, um, but I've run into some issues where no longer is this point connected to a single surface. It might be connected to multiple curves and multiple surfaces. Uh, so you might run into some problems where you're trying to move all of these things together. This is why I like to keep it separate, move things around, and then add them together at the end. <clears throat> All right, so that's looking good. Uh, this web down here doesn't quite fit anymore, so I'm gonna rebuild that. I'm just gonna say delete surface. We'll get rid of this one here, and we'll build our own surface from these edge curves. So I'm gonna use geometry boundary surface from curves, and then I can just pick the edge curves here There we go. Um, if you're having trouble seeing the boundary surfaces, you might have to come to visibility. The shortcut for this is Control Q. And I see I don't have my boundaries turned on. Now, with my view settings, it's just a darker line. It's a little difficult to see. Uh, I want to convert that boundary surface over to a parasolid surface so I can add it to the rest of my sheet solids. So geometry, surface, Convert, and I'll pick it here. Now this really only works well with planar surfaces. Uh, if you're trying to patch up some holes in your geometry, I love this technique of boundary surface and convert, uh, but it only really works if it's flat. If you've got curved faces, um, you're gonna have to find a different method. All right, so I've re recreated this surface. It's gonna fit in nicely with everything else. Now I wanna move it back to its correct location. I'm gonna say modify, move by, solid. I pick that there. And now I wanna move it from this point and I wanna move it to the middle here. So this is where Smart Snap is really nice because I don't have to switch methods partway through to find the midpoint of that curve. You can see in the coordinates it's picked the X point location. And for this one, it's the X CU mid or midpoint of the curve. So saves me a few clicks there. That's very nice. All right, at this stage, I am ready to add everything together. I'm gonna to use non-manifold add. Geometry, surface, non-manifold add. We'll grab everything here. We'll go with our default tolerance and we'll see how it works. Now this is a very important step in the non-manifold process. You get your free edges. Now free edges along an outside edge makes perfect sense, uh, but one like this 
that's not what I want. I want those to be joined together. So I might need a little bigger tolerance. The other thing I noticed is one side here merged up nicely, whereas the other side did not. So we'll see if a bigger tolerance is going to work, or maybe if we might have ended up with some small slivers or problem geometry from the mid-surfacing. So control Z to undo that process. And you can see down here in the message window, undoing. And the other way to check is to kind of look at the model info tree, see all these individual mid-surfaces. So we'll try it again. This time we are going to do a larger tolerance. All right, so that seemed to do the trick in this area, uh, but I'm still having some issues on this area back here. And if you look in the tree, everything added together, but there's these two, these two leftovers here. Um, if it was more complex geometry, I might try and dig in and see what's going on with these. In this case, they're just simple rectangles. I'm gonna go ahead and delete these solids because they clearly have some sort of issue. And I can just build my own. Let's say geometry, surface, corners. And I'll just snap in my own right here. There we go. So we've got those. Let's see if these play nicely. All right, everything's good. Now, if you ever need to come back to this free edge plot that you see here, you can do that within the meshing toolbox. This little one here is called the Entity Locator. And you can look at free edges, uh, non-manifold edges. This shows you exactly where we've got uh, two, more than two surfaces sharing a curve. And you can also look at short edges. There's, there's lots of good things that the Entity Locator will help you find. Um, but we can talk more about that in another seminar. I think our next seminar is going to be dedicated surface modeling. So we'll dig deeper into a lot of these topics. All right. Um, about 20 minutes in here, I don't see any questions. Uh, I guess everything is going well, or maybe you guys can't hear me. But uh, don't be afraid to chime in if you guys need anything. All right. So uh, let's go back to our presentation and see what other goodies we have here. So we've talked about Smart Snap. That's from the right-click menu. We've talked about hiding surfaces, so you can hide the surfaces of a solid, make it transparent, make it easy to see through it. We've talked about moving and projecting points. Um, this is a great one just to play with, set up some test models, see exactly how far you can push this tool. Uh, we'll have to talk about this one at the end uh, for solid meshing. We could do more elements through the thickness. We'll come back at the end, use this same part. And we'll do a solid mesh on it to see how it handles that. All right, so let's continue on with our meshing process. Now, there's a few other things that I want to add in here, um, like some washers around this. these openings would be nice. If I turn on my original solid and use this hide surfaces trick, this is one from Mark Sherman here. We can actually use these original curves here and project them onto our sheet solid using this command that we had been playing with. Project curve. So I pick my face. Now if I want to do it with multiple curves at once, I use the dialog select. And I'll pick these two here. And there we go. So let's turn this off. You can see I have a nice little curve. So that's going to match up and be the right size with the original geometry for that thickened section. So let's do it again for, uh, for this other one. I'll use this hide surfaces again to make it easier to work with. Pick my surface and then pick my curves. There we go. This one down here is a little bit different. I'm going to be mid-surfacing that extension. Um, so I could just pick a washer of any size just to help with the mapped mesh in that region. 
Uh, more recently, they've added washer and curve pads to the meshing toolbox. So let's do a washer factor of 0.5. I just pick one of these curves and it adds the washer there. Uh, some of my other favorites are um, point to point or point to edge. This allows you to split, let's say, point to point, just like that. Point to edge would be like this. Now we can we can go crazy with this model and divide it um, all different ways to make the perfect mesh, but we're going to move forward here. Uh, the one last tool that I want that I don't have on the meshing toolbox is kind of a surface slice. Now I don't want to slice the solid into two solids. I just want to split all these surfaces down the middle. I still use that command from the curve from surface menu or the curve from surface toolbar. It looks like this. This is where a lot of these commands originally started and they're now migrating to the meshing toolbox. So let me use this one. We're going to slice this guy right down the middle. So I'll use a global plane. There we go. That just gives me a little bit more control, a few, a few more curves to work with. All right. Let's set up our mesh sizing and actually throw a mesh on this part. Um, I like to use approach on surface to help me with my mapped meshing. So I'm going to start with this. And usually what I do is I'll select all of them and then I might come in and exclude a few surfaces that I know aren't going to work. Uh, like these here, these ones here. Really what I want is four cornered surfaces. So everything else here is some sort of rectangular or four cornered surface. So I can do a four-cornered mapped approach. And I'm just going to let FEMAP sort out what those corners would be. Then I'll come to Mesh Control, Size on Surface. We always want to use the sizing command that corresponds with the type of geometry we're working with. And we'll use a 0 0.05 mesh size. If you want, you can turn on your mesh size to get a little preview. That's looking good. So let's mesh these surfaces. And I'll just come up with a, a default property and material for all these. So we'll just grab something from the library. These are all going to be about 0 0.05, I believe. And we can give this a title. All right, so we've got our initial mesh on here. Uh, there's a couple of different tools that work out well for, uh, for changing your mesh thickness. Um, more recently, they've added um, mid-surface thickness and offset. You can select mid-surfaces or elements, and we can pick a solid ID. And let's grab solid number one, that's our original. And we pick our elements. And what this is going to do is it's going to reset our thickness of our elements to match our original solid. So let's turn on thickness. And for the most part, it's done a reasonably good job. Um, it um, upped the thickness here and here. Um, but since I manually rebuilt a few of these surfaces, you can see that it's gotten a bit confused. Uh, the other downside with this method is it's still only one property. The thickness is now stored on the element level. So if you want to modify the thickness of individual parts, you'd have to make a new property and reassign. Uh, for certain applications, this can work great. Um, I'd say for a final analysis project, I would like to create my own properties. There is another option here, uh, geometry, mid-surface assign mesh attributes. So let's try this one. And we'll pick a material and we'll allow it to consolidate. So you can see what this does is it finds surfaces 
it finds the thickness of the original solid and it creates properties for those surfaces. Now, it found most of them, but these surfaces that I created manually here, these flanges and this web, um, since they're my own custom geometry, it doesn't really have anything to link to. So, in an ideal world, uh, this would assign all of your properties. In our case, we kind of have to do maybe a combination of these two techniques or a little bit of old-fashioned hard work to get it to work. Okay, um, we're going to do a little cooking show swap out here. I've got the next model ready to go with boundary conditions, and I've added in a few other parts here. So I've put in some rigid elements, some beam elements. I've kind of finished all the legwork with selecting my properties and maybe even done a little bit more mesh refinement. But I want to show you guys some of the new element editing tools. Uh, I think these are really useful, especially when you come in sort of late in the game. Uh, I need to add some mesh refinement and maybe my geometry has gone or I need to split some elements and I don't want to reapply boundary conditions. Uh, that's where these tools come in nice and handy. So let's take a look. It's under Mesh Editing. First one I want to look at is Edge Split. So this I think is really useful with solid hex elements. Sometimes you don't want to set a real small mesh size for the global, but you might need to split in a few areas to add several elements through the thickness, or if you want to refine the mesh in some local region. So what you do, you pick two nodes, and it's going to go ahead and split between those nodes. Now this command has been around for a while, uh, but what they've done is they've added some more control. So previously you would just pick the nodes, and it would split, and there you go. This is nice because it will update your new nodes and elements with the boundary conditions that you were using previously. So you don't have to reapply pressures or reapply nodal constraints. So let's do it over here. We're going to do it a bit smarter. Um, I want to be aware of which is my start node and which is my end node. And I'm going to say I'll put in four splits. And we're going to put a bias on this say a bias factor of two. And that means I'm not going to evenly divide it into four spots. I'm going to have uh, elements smaller on one end than the other. You can see small elements at start, start being the from node. So there you can see you have a nice sort of gradient. And if you want to do something more aggressive, let's try that again. I'll do four. I'll try something like that. There you go. Very aggressive biasing there. So this is a really nice way to come in and modify existing mesh without having to worry about remeshing the part. Sometimes you just want to add a little bit of resolution here and there. All right. Our next editing tool is for rigid elements. Under Mesh, Editing, Rigid Connectivity, this is sort of a different style to modify your rigid elements. Now what you do is first you pick your element and it highlights it for you. And then you just pick one node at a time here to either add or subtract. So say we're going to be pulling on this thing in the X direction and I don't really want all of these nodes on this face here. I can just come through and disconnect those. Now this element has enough dependent nodes that I might do it the traditional route but it's a good example of how kind of easy it is to modify. So it's on the fly removing dependent nodes. Um, you can also click to add dependent nodes and this works for RB3s as well. So very handy. Um, you can see auto update. It does it sort of on the fly and when you click done your element is now updated with new dependent nodes. Uh, the previous method here would be modify, edit, element. You'd pick the element, and um, you can find the nodes in this list here that you might want to remove, and click remove. Or you could click nodes and uh, reset, and maybe pick the ones you want on, on curves or on surface. 
few more steps. So I'd say the new method doesn't replace the old method, um, but depending on the scenario, it could be quicker, it could be easier. Um, obviously, you don't want to use it to create a rigid element uh, if you have dozens of dependent nodes, but it's nice for a quick little update like that. All right, so here is our mesh splitting. Like I said, works for plate elements, beam elements, and solid hex elements. It does not work for tetrahedrals. Uh, it has a little bit of time finding a split path in the crazy sort of random mesh that you get with tets. All right, let's move on to some post-processing. So this is ready to run here. I've come in and applied several sets of boundary conditions. I have a pull, I have a twist, and then I have a side load here. So we're fixing at these beam elements or applying the load here. Uh, I'm going to create a new analysis set. This is just going to be a static set. And I want to use this multi-set option so I can generate multiple analysis sets using my multiple load sets. So it's going to use one constraint set, three load sets, click OK. You can see it just adds those cases at the end here. Now if we look, there's no master boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are defined in each one of these, these subsets. If you really wanted to be efficient and you're only using one constraint set, you can modify a master constraint set and that means it's only got to invert the stiffness matrix once. So if for larger models, uh, linear models, it can definitely speed things up. For this little guy, we're only working with uh, 2,700 nodes. It'll run very quickly regardless. The other thing I want to do <clears throat> is choose how my results get named because we're going to have analysis studies and result sets now. So some organized naming system would help me and kind of figure out which result sets came from where. Under preferences, you can choose results. And the first thing I want is I want to create studies. So that will actually generate my analysis studies. And then I get to pick my titles. So study titles, we can go with default, name it after the analysis, name it after the NASTRAN file, or I'm going to name it after my model file. And then for the set titles, um, a lot of times I'll use the title of the analysis or I kind of like the, uh, the subtitle. Since I'm working with analysis sets, I'll use those, those subtitles. All right, let's go ahead and analyze. There we go. All right, so here is our standard result set. Everything we get, you can see how it's named the output set after the analysis subset, and that's just fine. You know, working with three output sets, I could manage this pretty well. But here you can see that we've got an analysis study, and within that analysis study, we've got result sets. So let's go ahead and maybe change something. We're going to change the material to steel and run it again. Maybe you just want to compare uh, the deflections between two different material choices. Well, now with the original sort of method of managing results, we have six output sets. I might come in and rename these. I want this to be aluminum. I want this to be steel and I would have to rename each title. Um, the more and more you get, the more kind of creative naming you're going to have to do to keep everything organized. With analysis studies, that's kind of nice because we have these levels on which we can do. So I'm just going to call this aluminum, call this one steel, there we go. They're organized into groups. Also very useful for nonlinear analysis, where you're getting multiple output sets from a single run, steps in time or steps in load. Uh, that way you could do a multi-set animation for a given 
set of nonlinear results. And you can also do some enveloping of the studies. We could find the maximum or minimum stress values uh, within a given analysis study. So we don't have to go through and pick individual analysis sets anymore. We could say, all right, we've got these preset groups to work with. There we go. It gives us enveloped values here. So one is going to give us the maximum values in terms of stress and deflection. The other one is going to let us know from which output set that came. All right, we've got some results to work with. Uh, so let's do a little bit of post-processing. post-processing toolbox. I'm going to turn on deform and I'm going to turn on contour and let's switch back to one of our standard output sets here. There we go. Okay, so contour, deform, uh, I think all that's fairly straightforward. Uh, what I want to talk about is free body diagrams and multi-output vector contouring. So let's turn off the deformed plot. Now in this model we've got beams, we've got plates, uh, sometimes you're going to have solids as well, and previously you'd have to kind of choose, all right, do I want a beam diagram to look at the stresses in my beam, or do I want a contour to take a look at the stresses in my isoparametric elements? Well now they're going to let you do both at once. So let's turn on the thickness here so we can see our beam element. <clears throat> Under contour we can add additional vectors and let's choose something like beam maximum combined stress. There we go. And we can work our way through these output sets here and we get elemental contours and beam contours in one plot. So it's really nice. You don't have to generate double plots now for your engineering reports. The other new feature that I like here is, uh, is our free body section cuts. <clears throat> so collapse this down, free body. Uh, first thing you got to do is turn on or display free bodies. And then we're going to add a free body here. Now we've got dedicated seminars and videos to, to free body diagrams. They do take a bit of practice to get the hang of it. Uh, but I feel like this section cut should help simplify things. So section cut. Um, I'm going to turn everything off here. I'm just going to choose my free body elements. That way when I put a slice through the middle of this thing, we're not looking at loads, we're not looking at constraints. We're not looking at rigid elements. I just want the forces within the elements themselves. For a couple options here, I've either got my total force or my nodal. And do you want little vectors on every single node within the section cut, or do you just want one big total? We can do both, one or the other, and we can control all of this from the, the post-processing toolbox. So we'll leave it with the defaults there. We need to now select our plane, and we're going to do a normal in the x direction. I'm going to turn off my thickness so I can see my nodal markers, and I'm going to slide this along here. So you can see as I slide it along, you can start to see those nodal markers where my section cut has been taken. Now one thing to be aware of, and this is probably one of the most common uh, problems I see with free body diagrams is, all right, we've picked all these options here, where's the actual numbers? Uh, we need to make sure that we have the information we need uh, requested. So let's go back to our analysis set. You're going to hit edit, and you're going to come to the very last page of the analysis manager right here. This is where we request output from NASTRAN, and this is where the free body diagram tool gets its information to generate these vectors. Now we have load and constraint, so if I was creating a free body diagram at the boundary conditions, it would work just fine. But what about in the middle? I need to request force balance to be able to get this to work. So let's do that. We're going to run this again.
and we've got a new analysis study. We could say, we could call this steel with free body diagram info. There we go. Um, if you don't have a de deform or a contour turned on and you switch output sets, I'm just double clicking here, you might need to use control G to update your, uh, update your free body diagram. All right, so let's go back to the toolbox and see what sort of options we have from here to work with. I had mentioned um, the vectors, total summation vector and nodal vector. Now previously you'd have to drop down and turn these on and off. They've added some new buttons here where you can choose forces, moments, and they're just like toggle buttons and you can just turn them on and off right here. So I generally turn off my nodal vectors. You can see it's a bit of a mess in the view here. And I kind of like this button because you can say, all right, give me my, my forces and my moment, moments on the total summation. So it's going to take everything for this section cut here. Now let's take a look at some of the other view options. You can show your cutting plane. And like we were playing with earlier, you have a slider here. So let's take a look. And with this one, we're doing the pull load. That's probably not going to be the most exciting. Let's do this side load. So we're pulling this to the side. We should be generating a, uh, a moment about the Y. And we can see as we slide this along here, our moment goes from something like 33. As we get further and further away, that moment gets larger and larger. Uh, one of the last things that I always adjust with the free body diagrams, you can see we have a lot of near zero values here. I'll come down into view properties and I'll set a larger minimum vector magnitude. Let's say we don't want to see anything under one pound. That way it just hides all those vectors with just small near zero values. It makes it a lot easier, especially when I'm sliding this long. I can clearly see my moment about the y direction developing as I get further and further away from the load, whereas my shear load stays constant. So this is a great little tool. Um, for those of you that have had a bit more experience with free body diagrams and you want to know, all right, what elements is it choosing and what nodes is it choosing, these preview buttons still show you exactly what's going on there. All right, um, I think the last thing I wanted to talk about, we've got our elemental contour plots, we've got our free body section cuts. Uh, I said this last one here, element coordinate system, falls into the, hey, that's kind of cool category. Uh, if you've ever really dig into the results and want to figure out your X or Y elemental stresses and what direction they're in, uh, you had a couple of view options, but there were always a little fuzzy, not the best. Um, this makes things a bit easier. So if you come into view options here, you can look at your element coordinate system. We'll use a red, green, blue line and we'll turn this on. So you can now see what is your X, Y, and Z direction for your plate elements. Now this worked out pretty well for solid elements in the past. Uh, with plate elements you would just get a what they call their right-hand rule vector on the first edge. This is a little bit easier to see. You can see all of my Z directions, my normal directions are aligned, but my X and Y are actually a little bit random. So I'd have to uh, transform these results to get something meaningful. See how it works out well around a circular hole if you wanted cylindrical uh, stress results there. Okay, we got about 10 minutes left uh, to wrap up our hour. Um, I didn't see any questions come through on the, uh, the GoToWebinar software. Uh, if you guys have any questions or think of anything down the road, uh, feel free to email me. Like I mentioned, we'll, uh, we'll zip up all these nice little models here and this document and put it up on the Applied website. If you guys haven't checked out the Applied website, you really should. We've got tons of resources on here. There's hours and hours of self-training you can do. Uh, if you come in under 
resources and support, check out our seminar library. And we have online seminars just like this one um, going back years. So the last one George did was thermal stress. Um, I had a nonlinear one before that. And you can see ways back, plenty of topics here. Uh, there's always some sort of presentation, some documentation, some example models for you guys to work with. Uh, so if you've got some weird specific feature that you're trying to work with and you've got an hour, you could save yourself tons of time on the back end by checking out these seminars. Uh, the other new thing we've added is these five-minute tutorials. So if you don't have an hour to sit down and study deeply RBE2s and constraint equations, you just want a quick rundown, we've started constructing these five-minute tutorials. So this is great kind of first introduction to a new topic, like, for example, free body diagrams. If you just want the quick and dirty rundown here, five minutes gets you up and running. Um, I think at this point we only have about four or five of them, but we're always kind of developing more. If you guys think of topics that you want to hear, shoot us an email. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, create something useful for you. Last topic, training. Um, our next FEMAP and NX NASTRAN training class is in the fall. It's going to be October 19th. So if you guys want to come out to Portland, sign on up, and uh, you get to spend a week with me and we get to deal with all sorts of crazy FEMAP problems and questions and uh, dig into your own personal FEMAP problems as well. Uh, John, are you on the line here? I'm not sure if we got you. I'm here, Adrian. Hey, you want to say hi to everybody? Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, I'm John. I'm the account manager for Applied, so I, I see a lot of familiar names on the call. I just wanted to say hello and echo Adrian in saying please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, these guys have done a lot with these, these seminars. They're all available in the FEMAP library. And if you have any questions, if you need any guidance in navigating some of that material to find some of the best self-study uh, for what you're working on, give me a call. Give Adrian a call, George, Laird. Uh, we're here as resources for you. So uh, thanks very much for tuning in, and I'll turn it back to See you, Adrian. Awesome. Thanks, John. Um, one last thing I want to mention before we shut this down is uh, FEMAP 11.2 is a major dot release. They did some serious overhauls in the uh, in the code of the program. And with every major release like this, there's going to be a few bugs. So, so far, uh, the main one I can think of was translating CBUSH elements from older models to 11.2. Um, if you guys use CBUSH elements, um, it's worth checking out this uh, little update API uh, that Siemens has released to fix this problem. We're going to go ahead and put that on the applied web page. So uh, I don't have it in front of me right now, but just be aware that we'll have this information online. It's also uh, an option to subscribe to the Siemens bug report for FEMAP. I think you have to do a, a little bit of sorting so you're only getting FEMAP-related um, reports and you don't get a swarm of information. But we'll have a little uh, walkthrough online. So that'll probably be tucked in with this online seminar uh, next week. When you guys go to download, you'll see the API. You need to fix your CBUSH elements, and you'll see how you can subscribe to any bug reports. So this is a known issue. The development team is on it. Um, there will be 11.2.1 coming out, um, and that should solve any problems we have here. But in the meantime, we've got you covered on some fixes. All right, everyone, uh, thanks for your time. Have a lovely day, and uh, again, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thank you.